Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan, and on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Shruti Swami in conversation with Rachel Kong, discussing her new book, A House is a Body, Stories. We are so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during these uncertain times. We will be hosting, hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn about them on our website as well as our social media. Our next event is scheduled for tomorrow, August 14th at 6 p.m. with Sarah Schaefer in conversation with Bess Kalb discussing Grand, a memoir. For regular updates on upcoming events, feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button and we will try to get to as many questions as time will allow. Also, please consider supporting our bookstore and Shruti Swami and Rachel Kong by purchasing a copy of today's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We are selling digi digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. With that said, let me introduce our guest speakers for this evening. The winner of two O. Henry Awards, Shruti Swami's work has appeared in the Paris Review, the Kenyan Review Online, Prairie Schooner, and elsewhere. In 2012, she was Vassar College's 50th W.K. Rose Fellow and has been awarded residencies at the Malay Colony of the, for the Arts. Blue Mountain Center, and Hedgebrook. She is a Kundiman Fiction Fellow, a 2017-18 Steinbeck Fellow at San Jose State University, and a recipient of a 2018 grant from the Elizabeth George Foundation. Her story collection, A House as a Body, is her first book and is published by Algonquin Books. Today, she's in conversation with Rachel Kong, whose debut novel, Goodbye Vitamin, won the 2017 California Award for First Fiction and was a Los Angeles Time a book Prize finalist for First Fiction. From 2011 to 2016, she was the managing editor and then executive editor of Lucky Peach Magazine. In 2018, she founded The Ruby, a work and event space for women and non-binary writers and artists in San Francisco's Mission District. She's currently at work on a new novel. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Shruti and Rachel. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Book Soup, so much for having us. And thank you so much, Rachel. Um, sure. I'm just gonna, we're just gonna start by reading a short section from a story of this, from this collection, A House is a Body, um, my, my book. <laughs> and um, this, is from a, this is from a story called The Laughter Artist. Um, and I don't think I need to set anything up. I live alone in my apartment now, and my husband is not my husband. We split amicably, and we still see each other sometimes and give each other hugs. I've started whispering something indecipherable into his neck during these hugs because I'm trying to reverse the slow but total erosion of mystery that occurred in the six years of our marriage. The shape of a body, the body's intimate noises, love making, laughter, the muffled farts from the bathroom, the body's weeping. And there were times I had been with him when I was no different than I was as a child. And I suspected that he was no different with me than he was as a child, stupidly happy and playing, wrestling on the bed like naked kids. The screen dropped for myself in those moments without me even realizing it. The terror came later when I noticed it had fallen, when I was trying to gather myself up like in raw handfuls, but I was like sand all over. I couldn't explain it to him or even to myself, this absurd panic. It took hold of me when I cooked dinner or tried to read a book or sometimes immediately after we fucked and he could tell if he was looking. He described it as going blank behind the eyes. Still cooking, still moving my eyes across the page, still lying beside him, loose and breathing. The body lived and lived, but panic expanded outward, irrepressibly outward. What was I afraid of? Nothing, literally nothing, a van nothingness, a vanishing. For my final project in laughter school, I created a divorcee laugh. It took me some time to articulate and then perfect. I started with the pure laugh of a baby, then made it dirty, roughed up the edges. I had to perform it in front of my class and my professor, and as they watched it burst from my mouth, I felt myself becoming the person the laugh suggested, broken but swaggering, 
the kind of woman who lives, leaves lipstick marks on a cigarette. Afterward, my professor took me aside and asked me if I would teach it to her, which I was happy to do, sitting almost knee to knee with her in her little camphor smelling office. She learned it only after a couple minutes and then capped the laugh off with her own bitter flourish. Then it was hers, though she was, hap though she was happily married to an accountant. She herself was a beautiful, seamless laugher. Her face seemed to pull back a layer as it laughed so you could see its elegant structure, its bones. She taught laughter as though it were a foreign language, demonstrating a laugh and then breaking it down to its plainest syllables, which she would feed to us two or three at a time until we could laugh it in unison. Then we would break out in our, into our own rhythm and the laugh would shatter across the room. It sounded different in each of our voices. Lawrence's Malbec baritone, Jessa's creamy mezzo-soprano, Lily's surprising tenor. Timo thrust it all through the nose, but in Sandra, you could watch the laugh rise from her gut to her chest to her shoulders. It was deeply athletic, and she told me she had to wear a sports bra to class because it created as much, as much breast joggling as running. I could pick my classmates out in a room of laughers now, and when I hear their voices on TV or in commercials, I remember quite viscerally the body that created the musical sounds. It is intimate as touch their laughter. We're not in touch now, but sometimes we will call each other and laugh into the receiver, laugh and listen as we learned how to do. The laughter school I went to is one of the best in the country, though it is not a degree granting program. All you get is a certificate. I have mine hung up in my living room and I am proud of it. I am proud of it, but I was terrified to explain to my Indian mother what I had spent my time and money doing. I'll just stop there. Um, I'm so happy to be here and uh, be here to celebrate this amazing book. Um, I read it a while back and was just really floored by it and astounded. Um, I mean, I think it's always exciting when a friend writes something completely beautiful and that gives you more access into their mind. Um, and I think your book reminded me so much um, about the reasons that I love writing and reading, which is just, you know, um, that um, it allows you to be like greedy for more than just your own life, you know, it allows you to sort of inhabit other um, bodies and uh, ways of being and sensibilities and perspectives and um, your book did that so much for me, just I think in the way that you approach um, like physicality and um, colors and smells, I think um, even just basic things like comfort or discomfort, I just really um, loved it and felt it so vividly. So um, that's just my, you know, kind of preamble plug for the book. If you want to feel more alive, <laughs> perhaps you should buy this book. Um, but I just, you, wanted, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to start with, um, you know, the question of how did you come to be a writer and how did you come to be a writer of short stories and these stories? Hmm. Um, how did I come to be a writer? What a great question. Uh, I was, um, I, I really was a child really wanted to be an actor and, um, I was like really obsessed with Julie Andrews. I like wanted to specifically be Julie Andrews. Um, and then that, that increasingly seemed non-viable to me, but um, I think at the same time, and I think acting and, um, and writing are really similar in some ways. I'm like, acting is a really fascinating and mysterious process to me. I don't understand like what the mechanics behind it is. And it's such a strange mm -hmm. thing to physically inhabit somebody's body. And you're doing that with writing too. You're just doing it. You're not, it's not quite as physical as that. Um, but I think that uh, I became a writer because um, I think I had an early interest in stories and, and people and I had a curiosity in that. And then I also just had like um, a very lonely high school <laughs> life and experience where like books were my friends, like in a really deep way, books were my friends. I read them incredibly intensely, like I've never read books before. I mean, never read books since, um, where I was just invested so much of my imaginative capacities in these 
um, in these books. And I think one of the reasons I became a writer was to like speak back to them in some ways. Um, and that feeling has really grown, I think, that it's funny now that my book is actually, is entering this conversation that is happening um, in bookstores and libraries and homes and, you know, that it's like available for other people to see that I've been speaking. But actually, I feel like I've been conversing this whole time. And that's what writing and reading is to me, is this, time, is this private, intimate conversation um, that happens mentally. So I still feel, I think that that sense of feeling like I wanted to speak and um, and converse with books is is really the what drove me into writing. Mm -hmm. Wait, was there a second part of your question, Rachel? Um, how did you come to be a writer of like short stories specifically? Oh yes, yeah, short stories. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I found it very intimidating in some ways. Like some, and still sometimes I'll be like, if I have an idea for a story, I'll just be like, you just only have to write one paragraph not have to be long there's like something really intimidating to me i think at first about the format of the novel and a lot of my um i feel like like weight training or something was just like building up my capacity to sustain a story over a lo longer and longer periods of time and so there was a really long time where i just um you know it wasn't just because i was scared of writing novels but i think there was something so delicious and enticing to me about short stories and like the tightness and the compression of the frame um, around the story and um, using that frame to like look at my own life and like pull moments out of my own life and and understand them to be beautiful. Um, I think that that can happen in a novel, but there's something really specific of the frame of the short story that I was really drawn to when I was when I was learning how to write. And I still love, although I feel more um, co complicated or confused about what a short story is now that I've I've been working on longer projects. Yeah, I think related to that, I've been thinking, um, just reading through the story and just how, you know, uh, reading through this book and, and just um, feeling how dense it is with um, experience really and, and life, um, I feel. I was thinking about um, just the long process of making a book right and um, I think especially with stories um, they can represent such a range of your life even starting a story and then finishing it you know you kind of sometimes feel like a different person um, so I was wondering um, if you could describe maybe like the first story that existed from this book and also the last one and maybe tell us a little bit about who you were at those different periods Hmm. Oh, I really like that question, Rachel. The first story was Blindness, and I wrote it, um, you know, I wrote it in like maybe 2008, the first draft of it, but even earlier um, than that, I think oh, the could story you tell came us, to me. Would, um, could you tell us a little bit about it in case people haven't read it yet? Oh, yeah, Blindness. So Blindness is a very weird little story, my beloved little weird story that is... Um, it's sort of a story within a story. So there's a frame story um, about a couple and about a woman who is, um, it's about the dissolution of a marriage, the first, the beginning story. And then the inner story is a dream that the woman has um, and, or something else, <laughs> maybe not just a dream um, about a, a, a woman in a different situation and a different oh, a marriage that has been broken in a different way. And this, the frame story takes place in Rishikesh, um, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas, which I spent uh, some months right after I graduated from college. And that was the first time that I'd gone to India. Like I'd gone to India several times as a child, um, but I went without my family after I graduated from college for the first time. And kind of was encountering a lot of these, both the landscapes and the culture in like unmediated at some, at, especially in Rishikesh, unmediated through family or somebody to like mm -hmm. sort of walk me through and explain it. And um, I felt like I was often um, parsed or passed around as like a parcel sort of when I would go to India before that, um, because, you know, they'd be like, oh, she doesn't speak the language, which I don't, I don't speak Hindi. Um, or, you know, all the myriad beautiful languages in India. Um, 
So I don't really speak the language and, you know, I like never even like handled money or anything. Like I was just like a little, like a little parcel that was passed from one relative to the next. So it was a pretty profound experience going to India and, and at, on my own terms as a very young adult. And, um, and that left a profound impression on me. <clears throat> the landscape of the Himalayas um, is still something that feels very vivid to me. It's, it's very much the setting of this story. Um, and um, was really in me. Uh, so I came back and wrote that, but that story, because it was so early, um, it has gone through many, many revisions. And that mm -hmm. was the one that I was like working on kind of until the nth moment, I was sort of like fiddling with the sentences. A, very, a much younger person wrote that story and somebody who, when I read that story in particular, there's just, there was a point where I was like, I would not make those choices anymore. Like I have different, I have a different approach to language. Um, but, and so you, I sort of had to just be like, I can't fuss with this anymore. It just, it is what it is. Um, and yeah, I wonder if you feel that too, Rachel, that sometimes like there's this really tricky gap between um, the enough time where it's like you have the clarity of time to be like, ah, I know exactly what needs to happen. But then sometimes like by the time you get that beautiful distance where you like feel totally egoless when you're, you're just like, I just want what's best for the story. Like, I don't care about like, doing this cool thing that I was trying to do and like, no, whatever. Um, I, but then at that same vantage, then it's like really hard to enter it again because you're so different. That's why you have all the clarity of that. Does that happen to you? Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, I mean, I always have to resist the, the, ju the judgment of that younger person also. And, you know, I think try to preserve a certain energy that was there originally and like sort of you know revise the story to mm -hmm. that to that point so I was, I was really curious about that as well just like revising the stories um coming to it from from your distance and like from your maturity although i still think you need the your newest story the answer to that question oh yeah so me <laughs> yes so my newest story um, is A House is a Body. Um, and even that story was written in like 2015, I mm -hmm. think, the draft of it. And I did revise these stories, some of these stories more than others. The most significantly revised story was um, My Brother at the Station, which that story is mm -hmm. also pretty early. Um, I maybe wrote that one in 2010, but it was like the, the last part of it is pretty much just from scratch and it's very recent. So then in some ways, maybe that's the most recent story because um, there's the most of me as a writer right now in the, in the ending of mm -hmm. My Brother at the Station. Yeah, I was also curious about, um, you talked about, you know, writing these stories a fairly long time ago. Um, and a lot of the stories really involve um like being a mother they're about being a mother being a parent um they're about being married um i wondered if you could speak to just your interest in those subjects and in, the, in those relationships um even before you became uh, a mother yourself which is fairly recently Yeah, I think I was, um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think that I was just always really interested in those subjects. Um, yeah, I feel like there's almost no more fascinating. There's like something so particularly fascinating about the relationship that people, parents have with their children. And um, there is one dad, <laughs> it's like one dad in the collection, but it's it's mostly moms because I find women more interesting to write about. So, I, so they're mostly moms and yeah, it's funny. I think that, um, it just, uh, I've really always gravitated towards the physicality of motherhood and the, um, the strange ways of communication, um, that parents have, you know, that you can have with somebody who's like in this different state of consciousness and child consciousness and has like other, um different access to language than you do um mm -hmm. and um i had one more thing to say but i forgot <laughs> okay. i was actually um thinking you know if you reverse your title the body is a house for babies you know just on your motherhood theme for somebody <laughs> yeah that's right i'll give that to the english students out there um if you'd like to write a paper about it 
Um, <laughs> were those, what, what, was like motherhood, um, just being in a family, I, I feel like the way that you write about those subjects, it's just so, um, I think it's, again, just like you write about it in such a visceral way. And I felt really um, the sort of thing that I feel about just being in families period is like, there's this togetherness, but there's also this fundamental aloneness and, and loneliness um, to being around other people, uh, which I feel mm. a lot right now, I think. Um, but I am curious mm -hmm. about if you um, just notice these themes emerging as you were putting the collection together, or even maybe putting the collection together around these themes in a way, or if it was just something um, uh, that you, I think, intentionally, yeah, I guess I'm asking, was it an intentional um, grouping of these stories to, to come in the family in this way, or um, was it just something that you noticed when it, when it came together? Yeah, I think it was more something that I noticed when it came together. I spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a short story collection like a cohesive collection and what makes it satisfying as a reader, um, especially for a collection that doesn't have like a central theme. Um, oh, wait, yeah, like a central theme or like shared characters or anything. So um, yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. There was a, a version of this collection that um, that was just the first person stories because I feel like my first person mm -hmm. voice and my third person voice are actually quite different. And I was wondering if that felt cohesive to have those together. Um, but I started to feel like, yeah, I mean, it is a different collection. I love, I really love first person collections. Um, like, I, I mean, I can only think of one, which was Deborah Eisenberg's first book, which I really love. Um, but I felt like, yeah, when I put the collection together, I saw there were certain themes that were emerging. There were certain like um, resonant images that were emerging, um, certain voices that were uh, like that were all kind of coming together. And so I felt ultimately um, that it wasn't necessarily intentional, but I felt like maybe there was enough just like in my consciousness, like my consciousness as a as an entity that created these stories was enough of a cohesive um enough of a cohesion for the collection and that that um that those themes uh yeah that, that that i could see them kind of more when they when they were put in sequence like that yeah i wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um how you wound up with the the, the stories you wound up with in, in the collection and if you feel that they're asking some of the same questions, even, you know, sort of across their really disparate um, settings and characters and um, and themes. Like if you if you had to um, eventually leave some stories on out of this collection because they didn't fit that those central questions. If if there's anything that you felt tying these particular stories together. Um, yeah, I think actually I just, the stories that I wound up leaving out of the collection, this is like, um, not as exciting an answer. I felt like the stories I wound up leaving out of the collection, I just didn't like, I just didn't like them. I just felt like they either needed a lot of work, like with my brother at the station, that was a really old story that I just put in a drawer, um, for a really long time. And it wasn't in the collection as I submitted it in the, in manuscript. Um, and I pulled that story out and I was like, this does need work, but I understand what the work is and I feel like I can climb back in and finish it. But with some other stories, I just like, for a, from, for some of them, I could be like, I can see what the problem is, but I just mm. don't know how to fix it. Um, and there was just something about, it was less a question of whether they fit um, thematically, I think, as just like, I didn't feel like the language was strong or I just felt like, like this is boring. <laughs> I don't wanna read about these people. So it's funny because um, putting a story collection together as opposed to a novel, it's like you're just like gathering all of these pieces over like years and years and then like putting this little thing together. Um, that they're written over such a, in, and maybe this is like a more dramatic example of that than maybe other people write story collections like quicker than that. Um, 
but it is kind of funny how like how much I've changed as a writer and and yet you can see that I wrote all these stories you can see that my sensibility is there and my and my interests and obsessions are there throughout the whole thing it just still feels like to me when I read it I can see it as like a, a kaleidoscope or like a kind of shifting like mm -hmm. a charting of my of my kind of like coming of age or coming into voice as a writer yeah I wondered if you have a favorite story and if you could talk about it a little bit um and and the process of writing it a bit of a oh no Rachel I can't hear you at all oh no Ooh. Um, can you hear me now? Oh, no, Rachel. <laughs> you can check your, take your questions into the chat. Or you can hold up a little sign that says, <laughs> you're not frozen to me. I can see you. Can anybody else hear Rachel? This is or me? <laughs> hmm. Let me, okay, hold on. What about now? Oh no? no, Rachel. But you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> what is my favorite story? That's a that's a great question. And it's so nice that you had that little notepad handy. <laughs> what is my favorite story? Do you mean in my collection or do you mean in the world? Oh, in my in the collection. In the collection. <laughs> Okay, in the collection, my favorite story is um, Earthly Pleasures, I think is my favorite story. I mean, I have a soft spot for all of them. Some of them were written, like, you know, like Dee Dee is a story where it's sort of like an earlier story for me. And um, Dee Dee is, uh, me and my friend Chris were sitting one time um, in Star King Open Space like 10 years ago. And this incredibly lovely young like she was probably like eight just ambled she was on a walk with her dad and she just walked, like ambled up to us and started just speaking so confidently um and you know she's probably nothing like my dd but i just um when i when i read that story i just think of this like remarkable young woman who i met in star king and exists somewhere in the world dd um and so i feel uh, and a special fondness for it. But um, I think really my favorite story is Earthly Pleasures because it was probably the most fun to write and and also like the most kind of like transformative to write. There was a moment in it where I was really stuck and I just couldn't figure out um, what to do, how to make um, how to make the story keep moving. And um, and I just uh, I just sat there in in discomfort wondering what was going to happen and then something came to me so that is uh and that really changed the way that i wrote in my writing process it felt like um oh rachel okay well i'll keep talking to you guys no. <laughs> if, oh yay <laughs> oh no i don't know oh rachel i can hear you no now oh ow. <laughs> Now I can hear you, but I can't see you. I think maybe it's... you can see me. If... Wait, let me see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reconnect well, with you here. Oh no, it's I'm okay. Okay, yeah, I can hear. If I can just hear Rachel, but I... okay, I can hear and see Rachel. Okay. Oh Hi. my god. Hi. Welcome back. I'm sorry, Rachel. Um, <laughs> it's quite a journey. <laughs> um, this journey is not unlike unlike writing a book. So it's. <laughs> Medic coffee or whatever, but please continue about earthly pleasures. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, yes, earthly pleasures was my favorite. Is my favorite still? I feel a, a deep fondness for it, and I think I just really love spending time with Krishna. Um, I wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about just um, like writing itself. And something that I really admire about you just as a person and as a writer is that you're so, I think, like gentle and generous with yourself and very patient um, in a way that um, I sometimes feel I am not. <laughs> I, I, just, I just am impatient for things to happen. Um, so I wondered if you could just talk a little bit 
about your writing process, um, maybe in general, but you can also talk specifically about right now. Um, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> so nice. I don't think I'm always gentle with myself, but I think I'm learning. I think that there's just periods of time. I've come to notice about myself that there's periods of time where I'm just not able to write and that stopped being like devastating to mm -hmm. me or it's stopped making me like question whether or not I'm a writer because it's just happened so many times. Mm -hmm. And we were texting a while ago where um, you were telling me that you have been having particularly vivid dreams lately. Um, and I was telling you about this time where I had this, like, it was just a very stressful year. There was just a lot going on and I'd taken this job in order to write, but then it was this like horrible job, like, cause it was like a part-time job at this like whatever, but it was like so stressful that like, I couldn't write that, that year. I was, it was really tough. Um, and, but I had these like incredibly vivid dreams that year. Like I, and I still remember them because I was so. And I remember waking up from one of those dreams. Um, I was in a park. I don't actually, I believe and agree that mostly dreams are boring to talk about and also to write about. However, there seem to be several dreams in my book. And I think I also really um, am starting to admit that I actually find some dreams in particular interesting. And maybe those dreams are my dreams only. <laughs> So indulge me. I had this dream where I was in this incredible marshy park and I was walking through it and I like, and there's all these people in this park and they were like, wow, this space has been rewilded. It's so beautiful. And then I looked up at this tree and all these birds were flying out of this tree. And I just woke up from that dream being like, something in me is still alive. Like I'm not really writing. I'm trying to read and I like would make space for myself in that year where I write in my notebook um and would just like sit in my little desk and try and nothing was really happening or at least nothing felt like it was happening to me um i was so preoccupied by the other things going on in my life but my dreams were telling me that something was happening i was still alive to the world i was still observing and i was still finding things beautiful mm -hmm. and i think actually when i look back at that year a lot happened like i didn't write my novels working on a novel and I was writing like little like scenes or sketches or just lines or characters that didn't feel like work at, like work at all to me. And any time that I was like, OK, I'm going to like type this up into my computer so I can like make it into a novel, I would just get paralyzed. I like couldn't do it at all. Um, but after that year, I wound up writing a huge amount in a relatively short time. Um, just getting words down on the page and that was and then explicitly i could have been i would be like oh i have that did, did i write a scene kind of like that and then go back and it'd take me like a million years because i had like all these like crazy hand scrawled notes in a notebook and would like find that and be like okay you know and like modify that or sometimes i would just like just having rehearsed it in my mind or thought about it a little bit it gave me a direction or a pathway through my novel that i didn't know that i'd been making so I think that I'm just starting to um, really try to believe that there's so much work that happens even when we're not, even when we're not feeling like it's work, even if we're like, you know, even if we feel a little bit creatively dead inside, it's just like, there's just a process where it's like things are happening under the surface. So that is a really big part of my process. But like, literally speaking, I think that I just, um, when I'm really working on something, I try and just block off a couple hours. Um, in my day, my daughter naps. <laughs> now she's like sort of stopped napping. Um, she's she naps from two to four, and so some days I just I also nap or whatever. I take a little. Um, I just you know the other day I was like so exhausted and I was just lying in my bed and eating chocolate covered almonds from the plastic <laughs> box and listening to my daughter not nap. You know, so it's like I'm not always doing that, but. Um, I'm trying to block off that time to like not um, look at the internet and to like dream, dream, like have a little bit of open space. I'm really trying to clear more space in my mind I'm, um, right now because I feel like there's a lot happening. It's really hard to have space to think and dream and dream, you know, I'm, and I think like that can be sort of frivolous sounding. I think that it's so easy to make art making 
and art like and engaging with and ma making it and also consuming it. I mean, but I don't know if I like the word consuming in this context. Yeah. It's easy to make that frivolous. Um, and it, you know, when it feels like the entire world is is crumbling before our very horrified eyes. Um, but I still believe that it's important. And so I'm trying to make that space. And some of that is just like literally just turning off my internet and like just trying to read a poem, you know? Um, and that feels to me, I'm trying to name that as, as an act of creative work, even if it feels like I'm just sitting at my desk and reading a poem. Yeah, that answered so many of my questions. I mean, I think one of them was for sure, I had noticed all the dreaming in your stories and wanted to ask you, are you dreaming right now? Like, are you, is this a particularly active dream period for you? Yeah, I am dreaming right now, but they are mostly anxiety dreams, yeah. I think. I'm having this like recurring dream. I'm like, ah, I'm in a bookstore. It's so nice to be <sighs> in this bookstore. And then I'm like, ah, nobody's wearing any masks and I'm not wearing a mask. Oh, and no. that's like the whole dream. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah, I wish I was having beautiful dreams, but I'm not really right now. But even that, I feel like I'm trust. I feel trust mm -hmm. about that. I just, I think I, I just, at this point, I just feel so much faith in um, the human consciousness and soul to make meaning and find beauty in any kind of circumstance. Um, so I'm trusting in that, um, in whatever form that takes in my mind and body right now. Yeah. Are you dreaming? You're dreaming a lot right now. You're, you're I'm dreaming a lot, but it's, yeah, again, nothing, nothing exciting, mostly anxiety related. I was curious if you have any, um, if you managed to put together a little writing ritual for yourself. The other day you had texted me and some friends about candle recommendations. So oh, yeah. A, if you found a candle and B, if you have a ritual that you've landed on that you, that you like, that creates some space for you. Yeah, I am so interested in ritual right now and finding it really powerful. But in terms of a writing ritual, I did find, I do have a candle recommendation, which is very specific to San Francisco, which our friend mm -hmm. Aku was like, just go to Rainbow and smell the candles there, and then you can choose one. And that's what I did. They have a lot of candles at Rainbow. If anybody, hot San Francisco tip is <laughs> so you can go to Rainbow and find candles. Um, I don't really have a writing ritual right now, but I would like to make one. I do feel like um, one thing that's really cool about um, the, the in Hinduism, one of the main religious practices is a puja. Um, and I wasn't really, I was like sort of raised in Hinduism, I was like definitely raised. I don't totally know if my dad's an atheist. I don't think my dad is here. He can tell me if he's an atheist. He can identify himself as an atheist or not if he wants to in the chat. You don't have to. In the dad. chat, yeah. Uh, my mom definitely identifies as an atheist. <laughs> um, and I, so you know, and we sort of practice some rituals, but not not a ton of them. So I, I don't feel like I have a total mastery at all, or even comfort and familiarity with Hind Hindu rituals. But there is the the just the simple puja which is you offer something to God and you give all you, you offer something that's all the senses. So you have like a little candle, like a little oil candle and you have a little sweet and you ring a bell. Um, you um, anoint the, the worshiper with, <laughs> my dad says he's not, not an atheist. My dad is not an atheist. That's what I thought, but I wasn't, I don't know how you would define yourself dad. Great, but he's not an atheist. Um, he and so right so there's all the senses are are pleased there's smoke there's incense so you're smelling the smoke um and 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 then once you offer this all to god often there's like flower petals and stuff too the the worshiper um receives a little sandalwood paste and kum kum um which smells really wonderful and um, so all the senses are engaged when you're worshiping and then you eat the little sweet at the end because you just go like, you're like, here, God, it's for you. And then God's like, you can have it. And then you, <laughs> you get to eat it. <laughs> so that's something I've been thinking about um, in, in my idea of ritual right now and not in like necessarily a Hindu model, but I'm thinking when I, when I'm thinking about ritual now, I'm thinking of ways that I can ground myself and, and tie myself fully through all my senses. How are you, I mean, this all makes so much sense to me when it comes to like the book itself, uh, this book, which everyone should buy. Um, oh yeah, this book. This book, just in terms of, you know, <laughs> yeah, 
sense of what I was describing earlier, just for the way that you describe so fully all the senses, you know, smell, taste, touch, um, even just like bodily discomfort or comfort, I think I don't see that much of in fiction. And um, hearing you talk about wanting to be an actor um, and, you know, being in your body, that all makes so much sense to me. I'm just wondering um, now, like, how are you, I'm still curious about like, how are you making the space for yourself? Because I'm sure as a mother, it's like not, even as a non-mother, um, it's very difficult to actually create that spaciousness of mind and to actually feel like you're not, or at least I'll, I'll speak for myself, like that I'm not just running through um, anxieties or lists of things to do. How, how, do, how do you create that spaciousness or just maybe start to create that spaciousness? is one question and then another question i'm wondering is how are you like feeding your creative spirit right now and like how are you either like discovering new things or just i don't know how are you getting more inputs into your into your mind and, and soul right now um <clears throat> that's a question i would love to hear you talk about as well rachel um because yeah, I'm very curious how everybody's everybody's doing it right now. I think that I'm I'm not I mean I'm not really, but when I am, it's I think it's reading difficult books. I think it's like reading books that reading more than like I'm trying to meditate, and I have been meditating. Um, I have like I'm like just listen to these Tara Brock uh, meditations on YouTube, which are free, um, and like honestly, just taking deep breaths is so like it's like so cheesy but it like it's really been like sometimes i'm just like you can take as many deep breaths as you need to take right now um and reading difficult books or bo or books that on their surface seem boring or like kind of slow that make you like or like you just need to reread the sentence you re if you're not paying attention you can like read a whole page and then be like wait a second like i don't actually understand what happened on that page and go back um i think that there's a way in which like forcing yourself to slow down in that way can be really, it's hard to do for at first, but then after a while, it like brings you into a different state of awareness, which I find mm -hmm. um, really helpful. I think poetry can do that too. And it's sometimes not as uh, painstaking as when you're just reading fiction. Often I feel like fiction and translation is like that because um, I don't know why that is. It just, I sometimes think that uh, yeah, especially German books. I feel like I've been reading a lot of German writers lately who are like that. Um, yeah, so that's one That's one thing. And is there anything else I'm doing? I don't know. I think um, just being outside, going outside and taking a dance class is also helping a lot. Yeah, I think... Yeah, what are you doing, Rachel? Well, I co-sign those. I mean, I've been reading a lot of poetry only because I think as a writer of prose like a bad habit that I've really gotten into is like just speeding through I could read pretty fast you know just like speeding through books me too I, I read like really fast and it's like kind of bad where then I'm like but I didn't read it deeply exactly yeah so it's just like forcing myself to slow down by just reading poetry um and reading lines over and over again um yeah and I've recently started a little email chain with um a writing group, the writing group that I'm in, um, where we just send mm -hmm. one another kind of random art that we've encountered. And we each have like a day of the week that we go on. So it'll be like a random painting or a poem or um, a song. And that has been one way of just like encountering a little bit more surprise because I'm just like rigging the system. So I am surprised a bit more than I am. <laughs> But yeah, actually, you know, I just remembered that I was on a walk the other day with my husband and my daughter, and I just started noticing there were these like little chalk arrows on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, what is this? And it was the street trees tour where, um, yeah. have you seen it? Yeah. Um, where they just some wonderful anonymous like botanist just decided to annotate like street trees and then point you in this little loop around the neighborhood that Rachel and I both live in. Um, and it was this, it was so weird. I was like, it wasn't weird. It was beautiful. And I was walking through the city 
and looking up at these trees and just knowing their names for the first time and really looking at them. And even the way I was looking at them, I felt like I was looking like that's like the same posture and the same attention that I would use to look at art in a museum. Um, and it was tremendously moving to me to mm -hmm. that somebody did that. That felt like a really creative act. I to to that somebody did that and also to be able to experience it that um, when the old in the old days, there was this, um, this is actually a really long time ago, there was this incredible dance performance that just happened in all these windows down Market Street. Um, and you would just keep walking and then you would like look every, you know, the first person would like look and they would like see these dancers in like the mattress factory windows. Um, and I feel like one of the joys of living in a city, and I think one of the things that's so hard about um, this time for writers trying to refill their wells is that just living in the city was like that at its best. It was like this, there were so many cities we were alive in at any moment, like just sitting on the bus and listening to people talk was so beautiful to be able to do that. Or, um, you know, walking down the street or walking down a different neighborhood and um, and hearing all the different languages of the tourists or something. Um, we just lived in so many cities at once and that feels so flattened right now that having just even these little moments of, of just reframing or reshifting your perspective can be really profoundly um, creative, I think, and can really help. Um, so we have a couple questions um, down here below. First one is from Emily. And Emily asks, I'm wondering how you came up with the order of the collection. What went into the process of choosing the last story, the first, etc.? Was there a particular feeling or conversation between the stories you were looking to achieve? Hmm. Um, yeah, I definitely was pretty intentional about the, the first and the last story. It's always felt like the first and the last stories to me through every iteration of the collection. Um, but in the middle, it was kind of tricky. I mean, there were some stories where I was just like, some of the stories are pretty heavy, I think, and I didn't want to um, put too many of them. I wanted to kind of spread that out. Um, and I also, there was like kind of the balance between the third person stories and the first person stories. And also the feeling of like, the first story is like a very weird little story. And I wanted to um, <laughs> let the reader know that once they made it through that story, that like there would also be some like super normal stories in the collection too. So. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's a balance doing the kind of work that I want to do, which is that I never want my reader to feel like they're not invited into my book. I really want people to feel like they belong in my book. Um, so I, I, I was intentional about that when I was writing the, when I was writing these stories and when I was putting them together. But I also didn't want to have to explain a lot of things to the reader. I wanted the reader to be able to feel like I trusted them to put things together, make, bring their own meaning. I wanted these stories to feel spacious and to have people be able to walk in and have their own experience in the, in the room of the story. Um, so that was also something I was thinking about when I was putting it together. Another question we have from Mackenzie is, um, Trudy, your prose is always so beautiful. Could you discuss your relationship with language on the page and in your revision process? And that's a, a question I had too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I wondered if you, um, if you, you know, spoke your sentences out loud in order to revise them. Um, no, you know, I actually, think I should do that more than I do because I had to, I wrote a story that was an audio only story and I had to record it. And that was, man, that was very humbling because you had to read it so many times that I found myself editing, you know, by the third time you read that paragraph, you're like, I need to fix this paragraph. Um, but it was just like, uh, you know, but you had to do it like that many times. I've never done that to myself in any other context. And I do think it's like extremely effective. Um, you know, I think that the sentence on the sentence level, that's not usually, I definitely am tuning up my sentences and, and honestly reading them again now. And I mean, I think that it also is just the effect of being like, oh my God, it's in print forever. I can't change it anymore. A house is a body, the book again. Um, I, 
I, I feel like I, I could still kind of keep tuning them up probably forever. Um, but uh, on the sentence level, I don't know. I just, that's all has been, that's been not the easy thing for me, but that's not been the thing that I've struggled with the most. I think that that's been the thing that's always felt like I've had a, a very um, strong, for a very long time, I've had a very strong sense of how things, the rhythm of things, and rhythm is really important to me. Um, so how do, I don't know, I just kind of hear them. And then sometimes they like sound a little weird or it's like I get the rhythm right, but the words themselves aren't totally right. You have to tune them up. But um, I have really long sentences sometimes and that are stuck together and all these, they're like glued together and all these like, you know, with all these little like pieces of scotch tape or something, but you know, like all these like little commas and, and colons, not even semicolons. Um, and I can't help it. <laughs> I just like it. And they, and they work. They're beautiful. Um, <laughs> I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, what you yourself like read stories for. Like what, what do you love about short stories? And um, second part to that question, um, what do you hope people can sort of take from, from your collection? Um, I read short stories. Right now, what I, what I, why I'm reading them is slightly different than it used to be. And then I just want to understand what feels satisfying and what feels exciting about them. Because I'm feeling like a little bit of a beginner in terms of what stories, what I, how I understand stories and what they're doing. So I think what I'm reading now, often what is the most exciting to me is um, experiences of pleasure, of, uh, of linguistic pleasure, like sentences that are not beautiful for their own sake of just like being a gorgeous sentence, but a sentence that points to um, a, just a, a quiet moment of beauty in somebody's life or the possibility of beauty in one's own life, that that is like a lens that the writer can give you that you can then turn around to look at your own life and, and make it and it becomes more beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think what I would hope that people would get from this book is truly an experience of pleasure. I if 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 one is just uh, yeah, any kind of pleasure, actually, a pleasure in the language or pleasure in, uh, you know, a moment between two characters or um, pleasure in the beautiful cover. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's like, it's all, that, that, that's what I hope for it. <laughs> what was that most pleasurable for you in writing this book? Um, yeah, and maybe also in the last few days of just being, being a, published, a published author. Um, in writing the book, you know, there's just that moment. It's almost like when you are learning how to ride a bike and you like can't figure out how to do it. And then suddenly you have that, maybe that first moment of perfect balance, you know, mm. that there's some moments in these, in the times I wrote the stories where I was just struggling with what would happen. And I didn't even know that they wanted to be stories. And then something just righted itself. And I could feel, I could feel that coming into focus for me. Um, that's immensely pleasurable. One of the most pleasurable um, things in my life, I think, is that feeling of things coming into focus, things falling into place, me seeing a slight, like just that we're the next step, um, the next, um, not even like the whole way through the story, but just like the next step in the story. Um, that's an incredible pleasure. Or just hearing a sentence or having a sentence in your head when you're walking and then be like, oh yeah, a sentence. And then writing that <laughs> sentence down, that is also really <laughs> pleasurable for me. Um, what was the second part of your question? Um, how, what has been pleasurable about uh, these past few days, having your book out in the world? Have you heard any responses? Oh. Yeah, what's it been like? Yeah, I. you know what's really crazy, Rachel, is not one, but two Shruthis have reached out to me being like, I am inspiring writer also named Shruthi. And do you have any advice for me? And that's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
it's really crazy also because I've like literally only one time ever met a Shruti in my life. That was in wow. India. And one of them lives in the Bay Area. So it just was like all of these Shrutis just in different corners of the world, just waiting to tell their stories. That has been <laughs> an unexpected delight. Yep. Pretty, pretty amazing. And I'm sure there are more Shrutis to come out of the woodwork. Yep. Um, one yeah. can only hope. One can only hope. Um, well, thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm not sure if um, Dan of Bookseek has any parting words for us. <laughs> <laughs> I can come back for a quick moment. Um, thank you both for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, and just to remind everybody, uh, the book is available for purchase. Um, at the center of the screen, the little green tab there. A purchase keeps our doors open and is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, thank you everybody so much for coming. Thank and you. thank you, Rachel. Andre, for clarifying. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>